going to be some more folks that join us in just a minute. So Jeff is going to be helping me watch the waiting room. Uh, my, good afternoon. My name is John Fries. For those of you that, who may not know me, I am the director of the Center for Professional Education here at UTC. And uh, this is our July Supply Chain Lunch and Learn. And we're always happy to see familiar faces and new faces as we go each month and, and learn about new topics. Uh, a few announcements I'm going to go through before I introduce today's speaker. Uh, just looking ahead at next month's Lunch and Learn, our focus is going to be on supply chain risk management. And that session will be led by Mr. Kevin Cooper of the University of Tennessee Center for Industrial Services. And during that session, he will share process and tool that he has used to create a relevant, proportional, cost-effective risk mitigation plan. So stand by, look at your look for that, uh, look for more announcements around that topic in your email in the coming days. Also, an announcement for later in August, our next certified supply chain professional course is now enrolling. Uh, that course is a semester-long certification program. A number of you are familiar with those programs that we do through the Association for Supply Chain Management. So our next certification program begins in August. We are going to do that program completely online this year, and we've restructured it. Rather than having one three-hour meeting per week, we're going to do two one-and-a-half-hour sessions uh, each week. And I think I see our illustrious uh, presenter for that program, instructor, Mr. Chris Barnes, has just joined our meeting here today. So uh, if you're interested in learning more about that program, please feel free to reach out to me directly or visit our website at utc.edu slash cscp. All right, now for today's program, um, it is my pleasure to introduce Ms. Julie Sotulio. Julie is the Senior Manager of Inventory Management at Tennessee Valley Authority, where she began working in 2011. She has held senior level positions in cybersecurity, information technology, TVA police and emergency management, and supply chain organizations. Julie has led numerous teams to develop solutions for a wide variety of technology-enabled enterprise-wide challenges. She is a 20-year veteran of the United States Navy, thank you for your service, and a former GS-14 at the U.S. Department of Transportation, and has over a decade of experience as management consultant in support of defense, space, and energy clients. She has a Bachelor's of Science degree from Excelsior College and holds advanced certifications in risk and business resilience. Julie resides in Chattanooga with her husband, Francisco, and her two daughters, Alex and Tori. And Julie invites anyone who would like to to connect with her on LinkedIn. And I think, Julie, if, you, if I remember correctly, you said we may share your email address through the chat or something later today. Is that correct or did I get that wrong? Yes, um, you're welcome to share it through the chat. We just don't put it out on LinkedIn. Okay, that's no problem. All right, um, and uh, just a word about logistics before I turn this over to Julie for her presentation. If you have questions as we go along, please feel free to let me know. Uh, you can either send me a message through the chat or raise your hand. And the way we're gonna do this today is at, at various points throughout the presentation, when it's comfortable for Julie to stop and entertain a question, she will let me know and otherwise we will kind of keep moving through the presentation and we'll certainly let you ask questions at the end. All right, without any further, oh, and I should also recognize that the monthly supply chain lunch and learns that we do are a partnership between the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga and the Chattanooga Region Manufacturing Association. And I don't think I see Miss Megan King on the call today. But we certainly appreciate the partnership for all the partnerships that we have that make these events possible. And we're now very excited to include TVA as one of those partners as a, in terms of a presentation. So, Miss Julie, I'm going to give you, oops, I'm going to give you the ability to share a screen and you may take it away. Thank you. All right, just give me a second to get set up there. <coughs> okay, can everyone um, give me a thumbs up if you can see the screen? Yeah, perfect. It yeah, looks great. Thanks. Um, what we're going to talk about today is um, a multi-year effort we've been under to uh, change how we 
manage our inventory. Um, and we've been able to uh, leverage some uh, advanced technologies to make improvements that we'll demonstrate um, as we go along. And before I get into the presentation, uh, I do want to thank um, my partners in IT, um, Sam Moreleader and Jeremiah Jansen are the two developers primarily responsible for the solutions that we're creating in this space. And then also I have business partners from Scott Madden, uh, Jason Payton and Yao Wu are both helping our uh, supply chain organization manage a series of continuous improvement projects. So thank you to those folks on the phone um, who are with me today. So in an overview, I'm just gonna quickly touch on um, what Tennessee Valley is as an organization. We're gonna discuss how our organization, like many others, um, is under uh, pressure from um, different uh, problems in this space, and we'll talk about what it looks like for us. We'll do an overview of the Intelligent Inventory Initiative, and we'll work into the Materials Intelligent Catalog Assistant, which is the framework for our Google to Amazon type solution moving forward. Um, so if you're not familiar with TVA, uh, Tennessee Valley Authority, we were um, founded in 1933 as part of the New Deal. Uh, we have a, a tri-fold mission to create electricity, uh, economic development, and environmental stewardship. And we're a not-for-profit government corporation. So we don't receive taxpayer money to do the work that we do. Um, and of course, we provide all the electricity to this region, as well as we touch seven other, uh, uh, six other states. Uh, we do this by manufacturing the electricity through our, our generating assets. So if you were to think of this, uh, we have nuclear, coal, gas, hydro, solar, wind, pub storage, all of these assets, um, about 250 of them, are the primary components of how the electricity gets made. Then we use the 16,000 miles of transmission to deliver it to about 154 local power companies. So um, Nashville Electric Service, Huntsville Utilities, EPB, those are our primary customers and they in turn deliver it to your house and businesses. Unless you're one of our large industrial um, customers or a federal installation. So the concept of manufacturing electricity and running these assets is kind of the core of, of what we're going to be hitting into today. But like many other organizations, um, you know, things are changing and uh, a lot of our uh, assets are aged. So we don't have the latest and greatest technologies associated with our coal plants or our nuclear plants. And, um, gas is very new to us um, in terms of uh, an asset investment, um, but it's a very expensive investment to make, right? So with lots of parts and pieces that go into that. Um, as the system becomes more um, connected to different green opportunities, as we bring more solar onto the system and more wind, um, it changes how we run those big older assets, right? So. Um, those assets do not turn on and off at the same time. And that's one, or, or very easily, I should say. And that's one thing that's very important about electricity is we have to make the exact amount of electricity is what's being consumed at this time. So as you can see, um, a normal day, or as you can't see, but as in a normal day, we would have uh, a high load demand in the morning, or at night, or when it's hot during the weekend, at lunchtime, things like this, right? So there's daily cycles, but when you add in solar and wind and whatnot, then you have to really adjust how those assets are running. In some cases, we're not running them the way that they were designed. So we intend to focus in on how we handle the inventory to run these assets, and then how can we improve the asset performance? So not only is the uh, you know, utility industry under 
um, some change. Um, supply chains are evolving. Um, in the past, I think we were kind of considered to be maybe in the background. Uh, we, we existed, um, we spent over $3 billion at TVA through supply chain. And this last two years, we've made a big push to become not just uh, an order taker, but a, a proactive business partner where we can help shape how much money the company is saving through different solutions by bringing them uh, data, innovation, and getting ahead of their planning process. So plan, source, deliver is the foundation of our new operating model. And of course, everything that we're doing is to produce um, a benefit for the company. And as a result, we are now being seen as um, extremely valuable to different parts of the business unit where we were not before, right? So when we're looking at targeting inventory, uh, the first thing uh, we had to look at was just what were the challenges? And there are a number of them. And I have a much larger project than what we're going to talk about today, but it's centric to um, the data that was never put into our enterprise asset management tool, which is Maxima. So all the asset information from these plants goes into Maximo, and that's also where we host our, our inventory data. In a, in a perfect world, now that information would correlate and connect, and it, and it hasn't. It's been too hard to get data lifted into the system. Um, we've lost resources over time that used to do that type of work, right? It's, it's disconnected and ad hoc. So one of our bigger goals is to create um, a set of tools and solutions that will help the company make decisions, make them quickly, find the materials that they need, and understand that the material that we've made an investment in is the right material to carry in inventory. So I'm going to pause there for a second. Are there any questions? Does anyone else have this same type of challenge? No questions so far, Julie. Great. So the other piece to this is um, utilities often structure a lot of their, their capital and O&M investments around the work that they have to do to run the assets, right? And inventory is not capital and it's not O&M. It's a, like an asset on the balance sheet. It's almost like cash, right? There's not really an individual business unit that owns the inventory. It's collectively owned by TVA, right? But here in supply chain, when we make some changes in how we run inventory and improve the data quality, we can see a direct influence into um, work management processes, financial processes, how much liability we carry for inventory, and, and other components. So everything that we're designing is not with supply chain in mind, it's with critical business operations in mind. So if you haven't seen Maxima, um, this, this is a, a screenshot up on top of what it looks like to interact with in, in the inventory space. It's not very uh, user friendly. It's not a good, um, how do you call it, uh, user interface, at least on the version that we, we are on. It is, however, a very advanced um, data management solution. And it has uh, terabytes of data behind it for our company. When people go in to find things in the catalog, they're limited to um, a certain type of search uh, functionality that's not very quick and it's, it's not intuitive. Like I said earlier, the, if the assets had been mapped to the inventory inside Maximo, then maybe we wouldn't be on this journey today. But in, in, in truth, we have a lot of information about inventory and a lot of information about assets, and they don't connect. The other thing we use Maximo for is in our procurement space. 
So all of our contracts, all of our buys, everything is happening inside Maximo. So Maximo is, is like our SAP, if people use that as their uh, EAP solution. So on the bottom part of the slide, you can see where we were mocking up a notional intelligent catalog. And at, at this point of the mock-up, it looks a little more like an Amazon effect, where we would say, okay, here's an item, here's the picture of the item, here's it, its availability, um, the sources that we would buy it from are listed, the lead time is there, and what may happen in the future is that our business partners may put this in their cart and go, right? So that's an that's a down the road, two, three year out uh, plan. And it's very different from what we do today. Um, so just, you know, in a big picture, this is what we were creating. And this is what it takes to create the catalog from the inside. And I think I'll talk a little bit more about the catalog when we actually do the demo. But behind the catalog that we're developing is uh, Lucene, uh, search technology. Uh, we use Azure. Uh, we have um, different um, coding processes that we use to create the linkages between these products. And uh, Sam is on the phone if we have any technical questions, but I think this might be valuable for people who aren't familiar with how these um, types of solutions get developed. And the road ahead here, uh, we see that we're going from Google, which is where we are at the moment, advanced search, very rapid, and making correlations to our material like we've never had before and our assets, and then moving into an Amazon effect. And along the way, we'll add machine learning, a Watson-type artificial intelligence to the way the data is coming through. The benefits that we see from this part of the project and all the other projects are uh, very um, important uh, to the company, right? So we want to make sure that TVA is getting its full value from Maxima. We have 26,000 users of Maxima, and if they're frustrated because they cannot find the right material to do the work that they have to do, and they're, they're going to just work around the system and add more material because they couldn't find what we had, et cetera. The other thing is um, all companies are experiencing shifts in data value and technologies and how they're used. So the more that we can do to change the way we leverage the data, the better we'll be set up for uh, blockchain and other types of advanced financial transactions in the future. Uh, we'll also be able to begin to make better business decisions. Uh, a goal that we have as a company, you know, from inventory is to make sure that all of our inventory ties to the asset. A goal that financial services has is to understand how much it costs to run each asset, right? A very holistic view not the typical just capital and O&M type view. So different pieces of this um, project are bringing in um, different value propositions depending on who you are. The one thing I think is going to be huge is the time and efficiency. It can take upwards of four hours to create a, a work order if you cannot find the material and or people copy and paste past work orders in and just order the same material over and over again, leading to a lot of inventory returns. When we can help them find the right material in the first place within seconds, and then use machine learning and artificial intelligence to capture where they're making a bad decision or doing something that they um, we would prefer they did not do by saying, let's say, Enrique, you've ordered that part five times, but you've returned it five times. Are you sure you need that part? Because we can get it from Acme Park Company within three days, right? So that type of interaction from supply chain has never existed at a system level with our business partners, and we intend to change that. So down the road, um, 
this is a journey for our company uh, as, as much as it is a journey for any company. And incorporating analytics and, and advanced technologies into your normal business routine um, is not always easy or, or um, accepted, readily accepted by leadership. So you'll find that we've done a lot of grassroots type strategies to bring this forward. And for example, um, we built the tool this last year for $37,000. And then within three months, the beta version of the tool saved the company four and a half million dollars when one of our gas plants was able to find it to find an obscure part that has a 45 day lead time that had their full plant in outage so we're able to calculate those types of savings and as we continue to make progress in this space um, the company is starting to pay attention the other thing that's interesting is you'll notice when i show you the product that it's designed to be intuitive to most users. And I guess I might as well just move right into the product demonstration. Let me see, let me stop sharing that. Hey Julie, there was a question that came in. So while you're transitioning, I'll let you decide whether or not you're ready for a question or not. Sure, let's do that. Hard for me to maneuver in this space. <laughs> Go ahead and ask the question while I figure out what I'm doing. Okay. So the question is, is Maximo the primary tool for synchronizing inventory or do you also use ERP, WMS, supply chain planning, e-procurement, et cetera? What's the overall system blueprint? That's a good question. Um, so we use Maximo as our system of record. And um, since our customer base is not the same as other companies, uh, we don't have the same financial transactions that you would use an SAP for, right? So Maximo is an enterprise asset management tool and um, it functions a lot like um, an ERP would. We also use IBM, MRO, inventory optimization product, which is formerly known as Oniqua. And Oniqua is leveraged to produce our uh, reorder rules and adjustments on looking at what's over max, over age, um, what commodities are they in, et cetera. So those two products together drive the majority of our inventory um, solutions. Um, and then we developed a few other tools in-house. We have a material tracking tool um, and a set of dashboards that we're creating um, in addition to MICA. So. This is MICA um, beta. And you know maybe in two years, we can come back and tell you how it came out overall. We're right in the middle of development to create version one this year. Um, as you can see, like I said, it looks like a Google interface. Um, there's a quick features on how to search. And then there's also the ability to give feedback to the developers. You know, you got to send the developers some feedback every now and then too, just to make sure that they get a message, right? But uh, you see there's a cart up above. And that's all you see on this front screen. So let's say I'm gonna search for a breaker. You see I got 14,000 results for a breaker in 0.02 seconds. That's a lot of results. So I could, I could do a few things to figure out what's the right result. I could say, well, let's make sure it's at Watts Bar nuclear plant and Sequoia nuclear plant. I know that they both use the same breaker, let's just say that. So now when we look at the breakers that come up, you're gonna see that all the breakers are at Sequoia and at Watts Bar. 
So, you know, what we're building is a very intuitive search capability. Let's say it's the breaker I wanted. I could add it to my cart. And if I go to my cart, you're going to see that um, we have a list of items that are being built out for that work order. You could essentially build your work order like in, in seconds if you knew what you were looking for. Another thing that we're doing is the ability to break it out <coughs> by different attributes. So we could also go in and say, well, I need one amp breaker. I don't even know if such a thing exists. No, nope. right? Or I could say that I need uh, 115 volts. Nope. At least not at Watts Bar in Sequoia, right? But I could look for that parameter. I could continue to add parameters to help find the information. This is lightning speed compared to maxima. And it's searching through our data lake. It's not searching maxima proper. It's searching data lake. So and behind the data, we can make data correlations and data joins that are not possible inside Maxima. So let's say um, I'm reading this breaker and I'm that breaker person. I'm like, well, they should really should say that it has, you know, it needs an additional piece of information there. The company is now going to be able to send the information about what should be added to that part straight to my team we'll be able to update maximum with that data. That's an interaction that does not exist. And I'm sorry, I have to keep moving the pictures of people around here. The other thing we're going to do is be able to upload a new image. So right now, Maximo can hold one image and we'll be able to hold three, four, five, 50 if we wanted, right? But as many images as we could build into our catalog, they're gonna be at the user's fingertip to help us create the right repository of, of images. Everyone's aware that when you shop, you definitely want to see the materials. So we, while we have about 8,000 images in the catalog, we have over 800,000 line items in the catalog. So we have a lot of work to do to get that information loaded. Your phone was going off. You can also um, copy this information to the clipboard. And um, like I said, add to the cart. When we add to the cart, we will be able to um, bring that cart over for the shopping purposes. And we'll also be able to use the cart to complete the work order. And we're hoping to do that this year. So we hope to have an API relationship between MICA and Maximo so that the user can just send their whole cart right down into Maximo and then they'll push on and go. So um, mm. are there any questions at this point in time or any points that people want to make that I missed? There are a couple of questions, Julie. So hold on, let me, let me scroll back up through the chat just a second. Uh, one question from, I should scroll my past. One question is how accessible and expensive is the technology for your solution and how long did it take to develop? So that, be that might be a good question for Sam to answer, but I can say that it's interesting. We have all these products available to us right now. So because we run a large enterprise data environment, we already had cloud contracts. We have virtual servers. Um, Lucene is an open source solution, right? So the cost is, you know, in the development time, and in the infrastructure that you have, and unfortunately, TVA has a lot of robust infrastructure in place. But if you are a cloud-centric organization or headed that way, then I think um, having data lakes and cloud technologies together is the minimum requirement to do this type of solution. All right, and, and one more, I'm gonna unmute, unmute Chris Barnes for just a second. 
Thank you, John. Julie, yes, thank you for, thanks for presenting to us. You know, it, it'd be interesting to know, and maybe your solution does it, um, does it look at predictive maintenance and kind of say what's, what's possibly going to happen based on an 18-month maintenance cycle and then orders those parts, maybe, maybe not in it automatically, but suggest uh, purchases of the parts to make sure they're there? Hey, good question, Chris. Um, thank you. The Right now, as I mentioned, we were in development. One of the things we're doing right now is adding the work order and asset history so that when you click on your item down in this real estate down here, it will say which work orders has that item been used on and which assets has it been used on. And we're not to the point yet of doing the predictive maintenance. However, next year when we add the machine learning and the artificial intelligence, that's gonna be some of the concept. How do we take the future schedule and load it in for work, right? Against the, the, the material that we use and see can we target what we should optimally be carrying over a period of time. Right. So the idea of um, knowing how much material to carry and how much each unit is costing, making sure that we can see that relationship, which we're calling a pseudo bill of materials. Right. And then adding in maintenance cycle activity would be a natural progression, um, but it may follow the procurement progression. Because taking this from where we are today and turning it to where they can purchase is going to be a very large change for the company. Sure, that'd be great, thank you. Any other yeah. questions? Uh, well, let's see, nope, I think we're good, go ahead. I have a question for everyone. Um, who, who else is doing anything like this right now or who has the same kind of challenges that we have at TVA? Anyone want to offer up something? I don't know who all the participants are, but I know that I saw that there were people signed up maybe from Shaw. Uh, we had some utility partners sign up on some manufacturing companies. I'd be curious to see, is anyone using data and analytics around any of your inventory um, challenges? Or maybe better yet, who solved inventory? Chat07 says that they do. Can you share? I'm trying to unmute them. Maybe they can unmute themselves. For some reason, I can't. Or something. Jeff, can you unmute chat 07? For some reason, it won't let me do it. Well, I'm not sure what's wrong there. We're having a bit of a technical glitch. Why don't we go ahead and go on and I'll try to unmute them. So um, the other things that we continue to work on are also a material tracking tool. And this is another in-house developed um, product which allows us to take a look at any site and determine where the materials are um, which orders are in risk, and then also be able to communicate um, information about the material, right? So you can see comments coming in and who ordered it and what the you know, information is about that. So that's another tool that we're using around inventory that I didn't mention um, before. We just released this version and it's tremendously valuable to a company of our size that does different types of planning cycles, right? So in the nuclear environment, we plan um, six months in advance for major outages. In the gas and coal environment, we'll be lucky if we plan two weeks in advance, right? So there's a, a difference in material demand coming through. 
and it changes how much work can be done. So uh, this is another one of the tools that we're creating. And then we're also creating a series of dashboards. I've just been through a few. But being able to leverage data in this way was not something that we could do um, a couple years ago, right? So I think we're really on the cusp of having this type of technology become one, affordable, and two, you know, very user friendly so that we can create dashboards that show um, data to end users in a way that they can kind of parse themselves. So in all of these efforts, you know, our goal is to make sure that our business partners are getting the absolute best technical solutions from, from supply chain. So, are there any other questions? I think we have chat 07 unmuted now, so I'll let them speak. Hello, chat 07, are you there? Well, perhaps we're still having a technical issue. All right, while we wait to fix that, um, Sam, is there something that you would like to point out about this technology that would be valuable to the audience? You can hold down the space bar on your keyboard to unmute as well. Oh, sorry, uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay, yeah, I was, I just had a few thoughts around the question that was asked a few minutes ago about the cost and uh, time it would take to develop an application such as this. Uh, I think like you said correctly, it was mostly around the effort, but in terms of the technology, uh, like Julie mentioned, we're using a lot of cloud technologies here and uh, the core components of the search engine uh, itself uh, are developed uh, on top of the open source Apache Lucene framework. And that's sort of the de facto um, search engine component today in the market. So a lot of uh, search applications such as Elasticsearch or Solar, the ones that are uh, in the industry today, they've all been built on top of Apache Lucene. So uh, going with tried and tested technologies provides us the guarantee that the application we'll be developing uh, works the way we want it to work and provide the best uh, search experience for the end users. Uh, yeah, uh, that's, that's mostly about uh, something that would be interesting uh, to the users here. Thank you, Sam. Julie, there was also a comment, comment made by Carla from the Child Tech Council. She says that there is a data and analytics forum within the council. There's interest in convening industry data professionals to discuss inventory issues. They would be happy to do so. Uh, also, the topic of data lakes may also be of great interest to others. That's great. I think we might have some TVA um, participants from IT involved in some of that space, but certainly from supply chain, it would be, um, I think, beneficial to share some of what we're doing too uh, with some of the local organizations if, if there's interest. So did anyone see anything that they didn't expect to see or, or is this boring? It's Chris, Chris Barnes. Um, it's interesting how you're, uh, you know, I, I, I kind of viewed utilities kind of as uh, the archaic industry kind of people, no offense, Julie. Um, <laughs> but you know that, so it's neat to see how you're, you know, you said Azure already um, you, that you guys are, you know, you're not laggards in terms of using 
uh, virtual servers and clouds, you know, cloud solutions and everything else. So that, that tells me you guys are ahead of the curve, which, which is an eye opener to me. Thank you. Um, we, we are known as being very archaic and being federal and archaic <laughs> is a double edged sword, right? But here's something that's interesting. I used to lead the mobile virtual team in IT and we were structured to be able to have anyone in the company use, get access to any of their data 24 by seven, right? By 365 from any machine on the planet. And once we accomplished that using a set of solutions like Citrix, and VMware and AirWatch, um, once we accomplished that um, goal, uh, it became very clear that we were, we were mobile. So I was able to put a you know, fork in that stake and say, yep, we're mobile. <laughs> and that paid off. Right now during the COVID-19, where TVA, like every other company, had to turn around and walk out the door in one week and, and work remotely if you weren't at a plant. And so you know, we have easily 5,000 people in our Chattanooga complex, the majority of which are working at home. And they did that seamlessly. So that's a, um, the companies need to make these type of technology investments, uh, not just to you know, thrive, but to survive, right? And imagine how bad that would have been if we were not able to get access to our data and do our work from home the way we can right now. So it's really huge. Julie, there was another question that came through the chat. How many databases are you pulling data from to create your data lake? And are the shopping cart orders processed by one central processor? Um, I'm not sure how much data we put into the data lake. Uh, we looked at that yesterday, so Sam may have that answer. Um, TVA runs terabytes of data, and a lot of it's around supply chain. So um, we have a, a large volume of data. Um, but Sam or Jeremiah, do you want to take the question about the size in the cart? I can help with the size. Uh, so we are looking at data specifically for catalog related items. It's about uh, close to 300 gigabytes of data. So that's the size specifically for the search um, space. And uh, Jeremiah, would you like to take the question on the cart? Julie, what, while we okay, wait. Uh, sorry, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay, what was the question surrounding the cart? Is, are the transactions processed by a central processor or one central processor? So it'll be split up between um, a client side and a service side for um, basically, so that cart will be sustained when they leave or come back, but eventually we'll be tying that to Maximo. So it'll be split across separate processes. It won't just be um, our tool, it'll be interacting with Maximo directly. See, this is why you bring your tech team. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Hey, Julie, this is Enrique. Question, really amazing how the, the integration of information and the visibility, uh, which is critical uh, when you think about visibility and supply chain and you're creating visibility inventory across different organizations and across different locations. Do, do you think at some point in time, in that level of integration, as you think about, I'm sure some of the parts you have are stock, so you have them in your inventory. Other parts may be make to order or really non-stock that may be at your suppliers. Do you think at some day you start connecting maybe with some of your critical suppliers so that you're creating that visibility really at different layers of the supply chain? That's a great question too, Enrique. We are, you know, we have an integrated supplier of Wesco who represents 15, you know, other companies in a integrated supplier model. Um, down the road, we would like to make sure that we can host their catalog, right? 
and, and, and integrate in a way where we may not carry any of that material in inventory again in the future. So the inventory of the future is, um, this is really important. Um, QA materials are quality assurance materials for our nuclear fleet that are, you have destruction testing and they're designed to operate within certain engineering conditions, right? Based on risk um, of failure and risk of seismic events, et cetera. So we would have QA materials, um, long lead time critical spares, storm recovery, right? So every time there's uh, a, a tornado come through our region, we've got to go put more poles and, and wire back up really fast, right? So um, we keep storm recovery and we'd probably have safety limit materials of things that we consider to be bulk commodities or consumables at this time. But anything other than that may never be carried again, right? As we get more and more integrated into other companies' data lakes and we'd be able to um, intuitively forecast what we would be using, right? And be able to queue that up into their system so that they could deliver at the right time. So those, it sounds very, very far-fetched, but it's not, it's not impossible. And the reason you know it's not impossible is because that's what Amazon is doing, right? So Amazon is not carrying everything that they have. They're integrating layers and layers and layers of corporate um, capabilities and private individuals in presenting that information or, or that material in a way that's available to you. So I, I, I like to, when I hear things are impossible first, I, I blanch, right? You can't tell me no. But the, uh, um, when other people have been doing this for a, a decade or more, then why can we not do it either, right? So we're, I'm almost at the point of what we're trying to do, Enrique, is retail the inventory, right? get it up on the shelf, make sure it's visible, make sure people can see it, make sure they can find the right thing, right? Give them some logic so they can associate that, yep, that belongs to that asset. So this is the right thing. Help them put it in their cart and do their work order faster. So they can do their work order in 10 minutes or 15 minutes instead of three hours, right? And then um, eventually when they go to purchase it, they're gonna purchase it and it's gonna come in right when they needed it. and at that point in time, it won't necessarily sit in inventory. So when I can get a majority of common materials to be available in seven days or less using prime type technologies, then it changes the whole game of what you have to carry in inventory. So it's very exciting. I get, I get excited, so um, inventory nerd. <laughs> Any other so questions? We're, we're almost at time. Julie, one more on the inventory because you, you, you said it. Um, so as John, John mentioned at the prior, I, I'm involved with Apex and it's really about optimizing inventory. So one of the things we, we talk about is inventory turns. And I know you said that you, you realize some dollar savings. Have you seen an increase in inventory turns or is that proprietary? No, uh, this is, this comes in with the TVA being a Luddite. Um, in terms of technology, I'm just joking, but the uh, Luddite is a non-techie person. Um, we don't want our inventory to turn necessarily as fast, right? So when you think about the items I listed for the inventory of the future, some of that material is not high turning at all. Uh, our work cycles on some of our larger assets may be eight years between major outages or maintenance activities, if that makes sense. So we need to have material for those assets um, in a way that's available even if the asset is now 40 or 50 years old. So to have the right material on hand may mean it sits in inventory for 10 years before it gets used. So it's very hard to convince the company to write off older inventory. So we, we do a lot of stranded reviews looking for that. But a utility is not like um, a Publix, right? So a Publix runs inventory, it's what they sell you on the shelf, and they have to turn that material within the shelf life date or they, they lose their profit, right? So um, we're a little bit different. So we don't 
typically measure that. We do measure it as an industry. I don't remember what the percentage is. Maybe Jason Payton, you could speak to that from Scott Mann. If you're here. I am here. Um, hi, Julie. Um, yeah, turn days, I think Julie said it, said it well. Turn days for utilities are typically much, much longer than you would see for other industries. So as an example, it's not uncommon to see turn days of a thousand days on an item. That's something that's been sitting on the shelf for three years. I think that we probably are looking at, you know, to the point that Julie just made, the opportunity is really ensuring that we don't build inventories up so that you have five of those things sitting on the shelf for three years. You only have one and you have a relationship with the vendor so you can get the second part that you need relatively quickly. And you have some idea as we get into, somebody asked a question earlier about predictive, um, predictive analytics for preventive maintenance. If you know that, hey, this part's gonna come up, you're gonna need it in the next six months or so, you can carry them for a lot, um, a lot shorter period of time. So I guess in summary, the typical turn days in a utility are gonna be much longer than other places. I think the people that are that have good foresight on what's going on are starting to see that there's an opportunity to save the company money by not having excess inventory and limiting what's on the shelf to some degree. You won't take those times down, but you can take the volumes of things that you have on the shelf down uh, over the next couple of years to save the company money over time. I hope that covered the question. Yeah, great. Thank you, Jason. So, also, John, sorry, I John say we might have a uh, you might have a guest speaker for a future class there. <laughs> so um, Chris, one other thing that we are really working hard on is reverse engineering. So everyone who's doing 3D printing, um, additive material manufacturing, um, those are technologies that are becoming um, more accepted in our nuclear um, world, you know, the, uh, the nuclear industry. Um, so it's uh, becoming clear, of course, that you can't always find a very critical part. We may have to reverse engineer, and that also provides some opportunities for savings for us in the inventory space. Yeah, just to tail on to what Jason said, uh, I, I can certainly appreciate that. I, early in my career, I worked for Westinghouse, which I think TVA was a customer. And it, having the right part at the right time could mean a million dollars a day. So you weren't focused on inventory turns, you were focused on inventory availability. So great point. Great. Well, I'm, I'm really glad we had a chance to uh, share this information with everyone on the call. Um, certainly I'm available for questions or if we want to have um, a more interactive conversation down the road. It's very awkward to do this on WebEx. I like to walk around and point at people and, you know, do things like that. So uh, um, this isn't my vibe, but uh, I, I hope everyone got some value from it and I'd be happy to get some feedback um, via email or via LinkedIn or whichever way you'd like. I think we'll be able to share the presentation out for those who participated. And this was recorded. I'll never watch it, but if you'd like to share it with your friends um, down the road, um, that may be possible. John, All right. is there any, anything else? I don't see any more questions uh, coming through, but we did share your email address. And as I mentioned, uh, Julie is certainly open to connecting with you all on LinkedIn. Uh, just to wrap up the day, thank you everybody for tuning in today and continuing to support our supply chain lunch and learns. And a very special thank you to our colleagues at TVA for helping us today and by presenting this. We look forward to getting an update down the road and seeing where this is at in a couple of years. So thanks so much everyone. You guys have a great weekend and we'll see you next month. Bye guys. Bye.